The following was originally designed to be presented on a moving vessel on the Potomac River. It ran three hours with over 100 slides, offered live narration by yours truly, Captain Bill Washington, and gave the passengers the unique perspective of history combined with being able to see for themselves the contemporary river. The cruise encompassed the Washington Channel, Anacostia River up to the Washington Navy Yard, and the Potomac River as far south as Riverview, about three miles south of National Harbor, Maryland. As they say on television, it has been modified to fit this format and time constraints. The Chesapeake Bay region, which includes the Potomac River, is a significant setting in African American history. This region was the gateway for the first blacks brought from Africa to the colonies. Throughout the mid-1800s, the bay and its rivers were important routes along the Underground Railroad. After the war, newly emancipated blacks found their way to the Chesapeake shores, where they literally built the region's economy and shaped its culture. Slavery in the Chesapeake region began in 1619, when a Dutch trading ship carrying 20 African men entered Jamestown, Virginia. The slave trade expanded in the following years. Between 1619 and 1700, the slave population grew to 13,000. Between 1700 and 1770, the region's slave population expanded to 250,000. By the beginning of the Revolutionary War, five years later in 1775, blacks made up nearly one-third of the region's total population. In the 1800s, the Chesapeake region became a focal point of the national controversy surrounding slavery because it was in the unique position of spanning what became known as free, border, and slave states. Free states did not support slavery and made up the northern portion of the region. Slave states encompassed the southern portion of the region. Border states allowed slavery but were allied with the free states, further complicating the region's politics and causing great turmoil throughout the 19th century. Washington, D.C. was part of the border states with Alexandria, Virginia being the northernmost depot of the slave trade. Although it is difficult to pinpoint the exact routes that escaped slaves followed, records show that the Chesapeake and its rivers were often used as passageways to the free north. The Chesapeake segment of the Underground Railroad was an integral part of the anti-slavery movement. To this end, Chesapeake waterways were used in a variety of ways. Escaping slaves would quietly slip aboard docked vessels, which would shuttle them up to the bay and into the Susquehanna River. Captains in Maryland, Delaware, and Virginia hid runaways aboard their ships, risking high fines and jail time. Slaves working on boats also aided runaways by secretly smuggling them aboard. Slaves heading from Virginia towards freedom crossed shallow sections of the Potomac River on horseback or wagon to reach safe houses on the Maryland side. The Chesapeake region was increasingly divided over slavery. Pennsylvania, a free state, was loyal to the Union. The border states of Maryland and Delaware were pro-slavery, but also remained loyal to the Union. Virginia seceded from the Union in 1861 to join the Confederacy. When the Civil War started in 1861, the Chesapeake region became a divided battlefield and slaves seized the opportunity to escape. They often didn't have to travel far to find freedom and assistance with avoiding capture. In 1848, the nation's capital was still very much a slave-holding jurisdiction. America's influence as a world power and purveyor of worldwide liberty was growing, yet her seat of government did big business in black bodies. Oddly enough, 
Washington was only two days' journey from the free state of New Jersey, but starkly distant in its practice and acceptance of slavery. Enslaved persons had no rights. Even freedmen had no legal rights. They could not gather in groups of more than seven, had to carry their papers, follow a curfew, and were in constant danger of re-enslavement. A little known yet significant event in black history, known as the Pearl Incident, unfolded along the Washington DC waterfront. It was history's largest single attempt at escape from American slavery. The black organizers of this unthinkable undertaking were Paul Jennings, a butler in the home of a U.S. Senator from a New England state, Daniel Bell, a freedman who had grown weary of the court battles in his ongoing attempt to free his slave wife and daughter, and Samuel Edmondson. Late in the evening of Saturday, April 15, 1848, 77 passengers bound for freedom made their way through the darkened and muddy streets of the unfinished federal city. Samuel Edmondson got his sisters Mary and Emily out of two of Washington's most well-to-do homes, and the three navigated the gloom of the capital on their way to the rendezvous point at the 7th Street Wharf. These slaves belonged to 41 of the most prominent families in Washington and Georgetown and were valued at $100,000. What was to come in many quiet and subtle ways would change the course of American history. The ships set sail that evening. The Pearl's captain and owner was Edward Sayers, who had been secured for the mission by Daniel Drayton of Philadelphia. Drayton was to remember that although he was paid $100, he believed in the nobility of the cause of freedom. The Pearl and her 77 passengers, male and female, young and old, set out full of hope as they aimed for their destination in New Jersey, a two-day trip by river and bay. Once past Alexandria, the schooner began to make good time under fully open sails and freedom seemed closer than ever. But suddenly a storm came up just past Point Lookout, Maryland and blocked entry to the Chesapeake Bay. The ship had to pull in at Cornfield Harbor, Maryland, about halfway to freedom to try and wait it out. Then things went from bad to worse. As wealthy white Washingtonians woke up the next morning to cold stoves, undone chores, empty skillets, and vacant quarters, panic and alarm spread quickly through the city. Whites put together a posse which only grew larger as the scope of the escape gradually dawned on them. The pursuers fanned out toward towpaths that wound through the Maryland woods toward Pennsylvania, not thinking that the ambitious undertaking could have ever been mounted by boat. While searching, they ran across a gentleman by the name of Judson Diggs, a cab driver and opportunistic free Negro who had taken one of the escapees to the Seventh Street Wharf to catch the pearl. The passenger had forgotten his fare, which made Diggs angry. But what really made him share damaging information with the whites was that he was turned down by young Emily Edmondson after he proposed to her and knowing she and her family were aboard the pearl. The slave masters hurriedly pressed into service a steamboat called the Salem, owned by the wealthy Dodges, whose tobacco warehouses stand to this day at the foot of Georgetown's Wisconsin Avenue, loaded it with law enforcement personnel and undeputized civilians and took out in hot pursuit of the Pearl. It must be noted that the Dodges, along with former First Lady Dolly Madison and Senator Daniel Webster of Massachusetts, were reportedly owners of some of the captive Africans and their descendants aboard the Pearl. They were about to give up the chase and return empty-handed to a stunned Washington. When around 2 a.m. Tuesday morning, April 18th, they happened upon the Pearl docked at Cornfield Harbor. The whites forced their way aboard, captured the ship, and all who were on board.
Both ships returned immediately to Washington with the male slaves manacled and placed on deck for crowds of angry whites to ridicule as the boats slowly passed the piers of the slave port of Alexandria, Virginia. When they reached Washington, the slaves were sold as punishment, mostly to the deep south states of Georgia and Louisiana. The Pearl Incident, as it came to be known, was the fuse that led to an explosion of deeply felt sentiments on both sides of the slavery question. It perhaps tipped the tide in favor of the abolitionists when the world became aware of the travesty of human bondage on the streets, in the institutions, and in the homes of the capital city that styled itself as the cradle of liberty, justice, and equality for all mankind. Captain John Smith, one of the founders of Jamestown, Virginia, was the first European explorer to reach the Anacostia area. Better known for his reported rescue from death by the Indian maiden Pocahontas, Smith made several voyages of exploration along the Chesapeake Bay after the establishment of the first English colony in the New World in 1607. During his explorations of the Chesapeake Bay region, Captain Smith sailed up the Potomac River, reaching the Eastern Branch, later named the Anacostia River, on June 16, 1608. Landing on the southern banks of the Eastern Branch, his party entered the village of the Nacochtanks, the original Anacostians. From the site of present-day Anacostia and following the Trail of Fair Justice, now known as Good Hope Road, Captain Smith traveled east from the river to an Indian camp. His arrival in the region triggered a chain of events that eventually led to the relocation of the Indians. This particular site had been occupied continuously for over 3,000 years before John Smith's arrival in 1608. The Nacochtanks were members of a tribal subdivision of the Algonquins. They lived in dome-roofed homes made of bent poles covered with branches and skins. Sadly, the original Indian inhabitants, peaceful in nature and small in number, disappeared from their homes along the eastern branch within 60 years after they were discovered by Captain John Smith. Some fell to European diseases from which they had no immunity. Some were killed by other warlike Indians as well as whites and others migrated west or north. The first settlement of Alexandria was established in 1695 in what was then the English colony of Virginia. In 1791, Alexandria was included in the area chosen by George Washington to become the District of Columbia. A portion of the city of Alexandria known as Old Town and all of today's Arlington County shared the distinction of having been originally in Virginia, made part of the District of Columbia, and later given back to Virginia by the federal government in 1846, when the district was reduced in size to exclude that portion of the district south of the Potomac River. The city of Alexandria was rechartered in 1852. From 1828 to 1836, Alexandria was home to the Franklin and Armfield slave market one of the largest slave trading companies in the country. By the 1830s, they were sending more than 1,000 slaves annually from Alexandria to their Natchez, Mississippi and New Orleans markets to help meet the demand for slaves in Mississippi and surrounding states. Later, owned by Price Birch and Company, the slave pens became a jail under Union occupation. While not visible directly from the water, there are approximately 23 African-American sites located in Alexandria and 11 original African-American neighborhoods. The neighborhoods shown on the map are A, the Bottoms, B, Haiti, 
C. Uptown D. The Berg and Fishtown E. The Hump F. Cross Canal G. The Hill H. Colored Rosemont I. Southside and finally J. Mudtown and Fort Ward African American Community Cemetery. The city of Alexandria became independent of Alexandria County in 1870. The remaining portion of Alexandria County changed its name to Arlington County in 1920.